Hey guys, welcome back to The Base Brief. This week we're talking about Biden's pop pardons, Kanye going anti-Semitic, a male Karen calls CPS over Twitter, and oh, so much more. Let's jump in. Hey Brad, happy fall. Hey. Yes, I am loving the fall here in Michigan. We just got some apple cider. We went apple picking. It is so beautiful here in the fall. It's starting to get cold, but it hasn't gotten like frigid yet like it will in the winter. So uh, pumpkin spice is everything. It is back. Uh, so it's a good time right now to be in Michigan. Sounds pretty magical. It's still pretty warm here. I'm actually in a sweater today, but it's that's just because I'm cold all the time. Um, but I was down in Florida this weekend, and then I'm going back to Florida this coming weekend to Miami for Liberty Con with Students for Liberty. But I'm just trying to, like, get as much out of summer before. I'm not ready. I'm not ready for the cold. I'm not excited? even ready for fall. I, yeah, I am excited. This is only my second time doing Students for Liberty. My first time was last year, and it was in Nashville, so it was kind of fun. But, you know, Nashville is like my old stomping ground, so Miami's a little bit more exciting. We've got a big boat party on Thursday night that I'm doing with Spike uh, and the, Wu- the Wu-Tang Clan. <laughs> Yeah, that the right? rap group. Yeah, <laughs> the rap group. Yeah, they're coming. So we have a boat party we're going to be doing. Although I was texting Tasha Cohen last night, apparently Spike hurt his back uh, at their trip this weekend. So hopefully Spike still makes it. But either way, I'll be holding down the fort on Thursday night for the kickoff on the boat. And then I've got, I think, three or four panels I'm on over the course of the weekend. So I'm looking forward to it. What are you talking about? Good time. Oh, gosh. I'm doing one on national conservatism. I think they saw your and I's oh, discussion. Oh, fun. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm doing one on feminism with Joe Jorgensen and Kat Murdy from Cato. Um, I think, I haven't seen it confirmed, but Stephen Kent said something about us doing a panel on stoicism because he's very into stoicism and so am I. So I, I'm not sure. I'm not even sure, Brad. I think I'm on like four or okay. five. I, I need to get my We'll see if you row. can grab recordings so we can upload them for the podcast for people to listen to. I will. I'll definitely look into that. And guys, make sure you say hi if you're down there this weekend. We'd love to meet people who listen to the show. Uh, but aside from that, we've got a bunch of topics to cover this week. First and foremost, we're going to kick it off discussing Biden's big announcement on pot pardons. If you missed it, he took to Twitter earlier last week and he said, as I said before, no one should be in jail for using or possessing marijuana. Today, I'm taking steps to end our failed approach. Allow me to lay them out. He went on to say, first, I'm pardoning all prior offenses of simple marijuana possession. There are thousands of people who were previously convicted of simple possession who may be denied employment, housing, or educational opportunities as a result. My pardon will remove this burden. Second, I'm calling on governors to pardon simple state marijuana possession offenses. Just as no one should be in a federal prison solely for possessing marijuana, no one should be in a local jail or state prison for that reason either. Third, he said, we classify marijuana at the same level as heroin and more serious than fentanyl. It makes no sense. I'm asking the secretary and attorney general to initiate the process of reviewing how marijuana is scheduled under federal law. I'd also like to note that as federal and state regulations change, we still need important limitations on trafficking, marketing, and underage sales of marijuana. Sending people to jail for possessing marijuana has offended too many lives for conduct that is legal in many states. That's before you address the clear racial disparities around prosecution and conviction. Today, we begin to right those wrongs. So it's a pretty epic Twitter rant. Um, Obviously, this was met with really overwhelming support and approval by the vast majority of Americans who have for some time thought that it was ridiculous. We continue to put people in jail for any drugs, I think, but especially for marijuana when it's legal in some states and we still have people going to jail. um, What was your gut reaction? Were you surprised? No, I think... um, you know, he's had to do a lot of backtracking on his record as far as criminal justice reform and the war on drugs, because as many people know, he was an architect of many of this crap that was passed in the 1990s that led to mass incarceration and led to lots of people going to jail for victimless and nonviolent offenses. So I think uh, he's made that clear from the time he was campaigning on. Uh, also, his running mate, Kamala Harris, had a lot of backtracking to do on her own record. So I was expecting to see something out of them in this regard. I'm actually surprised it took them so long to get around to it but obviously I think the timing is convenient for the midterms or trying to get as many little wins as they possibly can before November so I think that it's a strategic announcement 
Um, one thing I really liked about this, though, that I thought made it, well, two things, my two favorite things about it that I think make it a little bit more than virtue signaling, because as many people pointed out, this won't, he does not have the ability to, to impact that many people with the stroke of his pen. This will, uh, he can pardon people in federal prisons. Uh, the vast majority of people are not in federal prisons. It's a very, it's a much more smaller population of the prison population there. Most people are, are incarcerated at the state or local level. So ultimately, this will only impact about 6,500 people. That's not nothing. He can still pardon those people who have been convicted for marijuana possession at the federal level. But what I think is more important is that, is that he uh, indicated he's going to put pressure on governors who have the power to pardon people at the state and local level. So that could, that could be a much bigger um, amount of people that this could ultimately help. And then I also love that he's uh, going to the root of the problem, which is looking at how marijuana is scheduled, right? Because this is continuing to be a very big problem because we classify it uh, the way that we do. It actually prohibits a lot of research and testing that could be done. Um, it continues to make it difficult even when states do legalize to get the banking infrastructure that they need to process those sales. And so if they change the scheduling of marijuana, it will make it much easier for it to be legalized across the country. So those are really significant parts of his statement, I thought. Um, and I think that this is not simply just virtue signaling, right? I think it's yeah. strategic. I think that it, it doesn't impact as many people as we may wish it would, but it does seem to have some real teeth to it. And I think that they are trying to really make sure we're righting some of these historic wrongs. Yeah, my kind of initial reaction to it was like, oh, hey, that's a thing I support. Like, I was kind of surprised to see Biden do something <laughs> that I liked, yeah. but I'm not the type to just oppose anything because a Democrat does it. Um, the more I read, the less excited I was about it, just because I realized like how modest in its scope it is. Some people are saying it's just virtue signals doesn't do any. That's not true. It will help thousands of people, but it's not going to help tens or hundreds of thousands of people the way that states doing this could. Because like you mentioned, most, uh, basically, I think nobody at the federal level is in prison solely for marijuana possession. But uh, even at all levels, it's pretty low. It's the kind of thing that usually gets tacked on to other charges. Uh, but it will help people who have served time, who uh, are trying to get jobs. Who um, So it is going to make a difference, and it signals a movement in, in the right direction. I do have to say, I enjoyed the memory that came out of this development when everything was like, about Kamala, they made memes about how Kamala was hardest hit because she locked up so many people for marijuana and drugs when she was a prosecutor. And now uh, Uncle Joe is undoing her handiwork. It's not literally her handiwork because she was a state prosecutor and this is federal law, but like you get the joke. Now let's break down her remarks on this because we actually have a clip of what Kamala said uh, about this that suddenly she believes that no one should be in jail for smoking marijuana. Take a listen. And speaking of the system of justice, we are also changing, y'all might have heard that this week, the federal government's approach to marijuana. <laughs> because the bottom line there is nobody should have to go to jail for smoking weed. <laughs> Hannah, let me just get your response to that. How, how do you feel when you hear her say these words? It's a little bit infuriating. I mean, ultimately, you have to say better late than never, right? It's the right outcome, wrong reasons, obviously. But it is frustrating to watch how flippant she is and how casual. Like, there's no remorse. There's no personal responsibility. This is a woman who built her career with the bricks of injustice. And she followed what I called in, in our article at Base Politics, the prosecutor to power pipeline. And this is something that you see them do over and over, right? They become a prosecutor and then they become a district attorney and then they become a state attorney general. And they continue, they have, they have broad leeway to decide which laws they enforce, which cases they pursue, what sentences they seek when they do pursue sentences. Um, she had the ability to act as a check and balance in each of those roles against unjust laws and to really nullify them and say, I'm not going to prosecute people for simply possessing marijuana. She didn't do that. She actually ran as a reform DA 
uh, in California, took out a guy who really actually was a reformed DA, and then uh, under her tenure, marijuana or drug possession reviews increased 25%. She actually sought to block people from being sent to drug diversion programs, which are excellent programs states have started to implement that uh, say, you know, addiction is a health issue and we need to treat the underlying health issue versus wasting money locking people up. Um, and, and she worked to block people from that. So it's, it's not just that she chose to enforce these laws. She was actually quite punitive and aggressive in how she enforced them when it was popular and when it uh, helped her career to do so. And now that the opposite is true and it's going to help her career to go the other direction, she wants to just do an about face. And, and while I'm, I'm happy, I guess, ultimately that she is changing her tune, it is, it is a slap in the face to the thousands of people whose lives she wrecked for her to flippantly now act as if she always held this position. Well, and now she's saying this is a step forward in correcting the historical injustices of failed drug policies. That's from her Twitter. Like, ma'am, whose historical injustices? Yours? Whose failed drug policies? Yours and Joe Biden's? It's just, I don't know. It, it is kind of this and that because... It is better late than never. You do want to see people come to the right side of these issues. But it's frustrating because they were not just like people who supported the wrong side of it in the past. They were the architects of it. And you can't help but think that they're, they're it's not like they've truly seen the light. It's just that the polls have changed. I guess, yes, it's all better than not changing. But it's, it's a little bit maddening. Um, I also think it's great. Like... Joe Biden still does not, in 2022, does not support marijuana legalization. He supports decrim, which is better than nothing, decriminalization, but that doesn't, uh, that would just mean you stop criminalizing it, but that doesn't mean you allow it to operate legally. And I'm like, at that point, he's got to have some sort of principle attached to drug, being a drug warrior, because if you were just going by the polls, you would support legalization. It's overwhelmingly popular. So... Uh, this on well, them, I, mean, I actually I kind of want to weigh in on that just briefly and say I don't think this is an excuse I still think it's a very uneducated stance but uh, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more in the podcast later actually but as a person who has a son who struggles with addiction very clearly struggles with drug addiction I kind of understand where Biden's coming from again it's an outdated notion that marijuana is a gateway drug it absolutely is not trauma is the gateway drug but there's a lot of people who have who kind of came up in the craze of the anti-drug war in the 70s and 80s who had that sort of beat into them and I could see why somebody who has a son who has addiction issues might still hesitate around legalization I, I still think it's wrong and that you shouldn't be making public policy based on your emotions but I, I guess I do give him a little leeway on that given the, what we know behind the scenes about his family yeah that would make sense as like an emotional response it wouldn't really be logical but that could be it uh, let's talk about so one thing that was really interesting about Biden's move was the lack of blowback from the Republican Party, really. Uh, uh, most people were either silent or some were even like, hey, this is a good idea. Um, it, it's just interesting because almost everything Biden does, Republicans and conservative media immediately pounce and criticize him, including us oftentimes, right? Like, sure. Uh, but on this one, very few people criticized him. It was a pretty small minority. Of course, however, it included Senator Tom Cotton, a, a hardcore <laughs> tough on crime in biggest air quotes possible uh republican senator who is kind of this populist nationalist big government type he tweeted out a very critical response of president biden's pot pardons saying in the midst of a crime wave and on the brink of a recession that because the, the relevance of the recession joe biden is giving blanket pardons to drug offenders many of whom pled down from more serious charges this is a desperate attempt to distract from failed leadership. Now, I thought that, one, it takes a lot of audacity to claim to be a limited government Republican than sit here defending, blocking people up for marijuana possession. Uh, but two, this idea that, well, he's pardoning people who uh, are charged with drug possession of marijuana only, but they may have pled down from more serious charges. So you're saying they should be punished based on hypothetical crimes they were never convicted of and never pled guilty to? Huh? That's nuts. 
Yeah, well, Tom Cotton is one of the biggest hacks in all of Congress. This guy has literally said that we have an under-incarceration problem in this country, which is just bonkers. And speaking of the prosecutor to power pipeline, he's still on it, right? He's still on the up and up. He's still trying to like get to his next level, and he thinks this is how you do it in the GOP. He's wrong, because most people have moved on from this 10 years ago, but that's what he thinks, where he thinks the tide is. So um, I think he's crazy, honestly. This is one of m multiple issues I think he's just absolutely bonkers on. He's also really crazy when it comes to like war and foreign policy. So I don't give anything he has to say a whole lot of credence, but this is particularly a hilarious assessment because what you're actually saying, if this is your talking point, is, and this is not true, right, that anybody in, in jail for marijuana possession pled down, right? That's not always the case. But if, it, if that is what you're trying to allege, what you're saying is that prosecutors let people off for much more heinous crimes versus prosecuting them for those crimes and putting them in jail. So wouldn't wouldn't that be pretty soft on crime? Like, I don't understand what your argument is here. That sounds like a pretty big failure of the system if that is what happened. It's not what happened. But, like, that's and just due process, assertion. right? It's like they weren't, you're saying, well, we shouldn't let them out of jail because they originally had more or higher charges. It's like, well, they weren't convicted of those charges. They never yeah. gu pled guilty to those charges. So you can't, that's absurd. Yeah, that drives me nuts. I, I, and I'm sure you could look up Tom Cotton, Brett Kavanaugh, and hear him waxing poetic about due process. And look, I would agree. I agreed with him on that issue. But it's like the the absolute inconsistency of so many of these people is really galling because it's like, do they not understand that in 2022 we always have receipts? <laughs> think they do not sure they really know exactly how the internet works still but i mean the only thing i agree with tom cotton here is like i do think this is an attempt to distract from biden's failed leadership like the timing like i said is not coincidental so that's the only part that makes a lot of sense the rest of this i just think it sounds really outdated it, it sounds like somebody from the 1980s running around warning about reefer madness so yeah. next thing you know he's gonna be warning us to check our halloween candy for free drugs <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite thing this time of year when like people start pulling that out like check your kids check, check your kids trick or treat bags for fentanyl. It's like nobody's giving their free drugs to your kids. Like what? That's never happened. It's just crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. Anyway, Biden did something actually kind of good for once. We're not going to pretend it's bad just cuz he did it. Uh and thankfully n neither are most people. It won't make a huge difference, but hey, we'll take small wins where we can get them. But now Hannah we need to talk about the GOP's Kanye problem. Let's start Ugh. with a tweet from the yeah, House crazy. Judiciary Committee, which this is very strange. This is like the Republicans on the legal and judicial nomination committee in the House, like a very serious legal affairs committee. They just tweeted Kanye, period, Elon, period, Trump, period. Like this is... The new Republican Party. And I have questions. Like, this is like those t-shirts they make that, like, list all the names of, like, a band that people like. They're trying to do that, essentially. The yeah, thing. they're saying, like, this is our squad. <laughs> like, oh, the God. Only, <laughs> the only one on there who's half decent is Elon. But yeah. this comes in the context. The GOP, it, they, they went, uh, and this is just one tweet, but it's an official party account. And, uh... Also, a lot of people on the right over the last week or so have embraced Kanye West with open arms, bear hugged him and said, one of us, one of us. And they did that because he just did this bombshell interview with, with Tucker Carlson where he sat down for about an hour. He talks about being pro-life. He criticized Obama. He praised Trump. Uh, here's a clip from him where he uh, talks about his pro-life views. So you just came from Paris Fashion Week, you just landed, and you have a lanyard still on from it, and there's a photograph on it. What is that? It's a photograph of a baby's ultrasound. Why is that? And that you designed that? Yes. Why? What does that mean? Uh, it just represents life and pro-life. Boy, so you wear it on a badge. What, what kind of response do you get? And, and good, amen, I agree. I don't care about people's responses. I care about the fact that there's more black babies being aborted than born in New York City at this point. That 50% of black death in America is abortion. So I really don't care about people's responses. I perform for an audience of one and that's God. Now I actually find a lot of what he says there kind of extreme and a little bit off-putting, but whatever you may think of it, that's what got Republicans all excited. Um, and so they wrap their arms in him and that actually hasn't aged very well. 
in, in something that might shock you. That wrapping your arms around a psychologically disturbed celebrity rapper uh, who's all over the place just because he says a few things you agree with. And now, just a few days ago, Kanye West tweets, I'm a bit sleepy tonight, but when I wake up, I'm going DEATHCON 3 on JEWISH PEOPLE in all caps. The funny thing is, I actually can't be anti-Semitic because black people are actually Jew also. You guys have toyed with me and tried to blackball anyone whoever opposes your agenda. Oh boy. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> holy cow. This is, I agree with you, like, this was predictable. Kanye has been a loose cannon for quite some time. I've never understood this. I see it, I observe it in both the conservative realm and also the evangelical realm. It's like they hate Hollywood, they hate people in the entertainment industry, they feel like they're all against them, it's all left wing, and they're not totally wrong about that. But they are so yeah. desperate to have their views regurgitated to them by somebody famous that the minute somebody validates them, they are all in on that celebrity, that's their guy, they're obsessed, and it just usually happens to be that these people are unhinged. Like, it, it happens over and over and over again, right? Kanye is, is not well. He has famously struggled with mental illness. I don't want to make light of that at all, but this is a person who has put his kids in danger by like publicly saying where they go to school. He said publicly they almost aborted his daughter when he was running for office a few years ago. His wife had to leave him because he was so unhinged and would not get help. Like this is just somebody who I think uh, it's sad is in the public eye at this point. He's clearly at a level where nobody can get a hold of him or really like pressure him to get help, but he needs help, right? And instead we're seeing this sort of spiral publicly and it's it's really sad to observe, but it's even weirder to watch conservatives rally around him and somehow feel that his support for their views lends credence to them or makes them more valid. I don't really understand that need at all. I've never needed a celebrity to vouch for my views to think that they're correct or to feel strong in them, but I guess some people do and that's what we're observing going on. But this this term is anti-Semitic and I do think that's a new level of crazy that we've seen out of Kanye. I'm not actually even sure what all he's talking about here, saying that black people are also Jewish people and therefore he can't be anti-Semitic. That's, that's not how racism works, right? You can be racist no matter what race you are. And this conspiracy that Jewish people are running everything and somehow ruining our lives, it's, I think it's a very disgusting one that continues to crop up in, in multiple areas, but especially in politics. And it's dangerous. It leads to Jewish people being harmed. So absolutely reject that wholeheartedly. And, and I think conservatives need to learn a lesson here and quit running to wrap their arms around any celebrity who like throws a little a bone their way every once in a while. You hit the nail on the head just a minute ago when you made that point because it's like Republicans, conservatives, everything. They're like, oh, the Hollywood woke elite. They suck. They're all libs, blah, blah, blah. Why would we listen to them? Shut up and dribble. And I low-key agree with them. I agree. I don't care what actors, singers, etc. have to say about politics because they have no special expertise compared to a random person off the street. Uh, however, as soon as one singer, actor, rapper, or anything of any kind says something that mildly signals their alignment with the right, Republicans and conservatives who were just saying, like, woke elites, ignore them, they don't represent the people, blah, 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 run over and are like, oh my God, Kanye, daddy, Kanye 2024, yes, pro-life king. It's like, it all goes out the window in a hot second. And I'm like, this is so stupid. If you think people should shut up and dribble when it's LeBron James, well then Kanye should shut up and rap and stay out of politics, especially if you know he has mental issues that he's working through and he's not all, he's not in full control of himself and he's going to start tweeting about death con three on Jewish people. This is nuts. And it's also completely predictable. This is not new. We've known Kanye West has these issues for years now. We've seen him do crazy stuff after crazy stuff. Yet he says one pro-life thing on a Fox News interview, uh, which they're just mining him for clicks and views, I guess. I, I don't know what's going on there. But he says one pro-life thing. And then everybody is like, yes, he's our hero. And then just a couple of days later, he's tweeting insane anti-Semitic things. Where is the House Judiciary Committee now? Where's the follow-up tweet? Right? Yeah. Like, I seriously, I want to know. Like, you, you want to wrap your arms around this guy when he says something you like. You have to own it now that he's gone full nut job again. Seriously, just, just it's not hard 
to not celebrity worship in politics. But apparently it's very challenging for both the Democrats, obviously, and then the Republicans who say they can't stand this kind of thing. Because the second one person winks at them a little bit, they're hoes. They're literally so thirsty for any celebrity <laughs> attention. It, they're literally hoes. I'm sorry. And it's just a joke. No, I agree with you. It's also like, I think it was just last week you'd written an article where he and Candace Owens were out trying to get clicks wearing All Lives Matter t-shirts. and it's like, Nope, not even All Lives Matter. White, oh, white lives, lives Matter. matter. <laughs> and it's like, much oh, worse. Now, right, so much worse. And also like, again, so predictable. Like, oh, turns out he's racist. I am shocked. I am floored by that. Who could have seen that turn coming? Like, I'm so tired of this. And I'm also tired of them not coming out and actually, like, condemning this kind of, of talk from people that are in their camp. We've seen it from Trump. Now we're seeing it from Kanye. It's like, if you're fine with this kind of statement, these kinds of, like, claims, then, like, I think it is a dog whistle. And it's disappointing to me because I remember growing up a group Republican and I would never understand when people said the GOP was racist or racist sympathetic. And I was like, what are they talking about? Like, they're not. I've never met anybody who is. And then, like, as I grew up and started actually working in politics and seeing some stuff like this and seeing the lack of condemnation it gets, I was like, oh, okay. I guess I do see what you guys were talking about all along. And it really does hinder every bit of effort that goes into good principles that these people claim to stand for, like limited government and individual liberty, which should absolutely at all times condemn racism and racist um, bigotry and, and free markets. And it's like, it starts to get wrapped up with these kinds of people. And therefore it actually demolishes the things you say you stand for. And, and it takes away um, their impact on people you should be trying to convert. So I, I hate all of this. I can't stand it. It has a lot to do with why I left the GOP and don't associate with them anymore. But I think this should be, condemned and and i think people need to be really careful with who they let be their strong man yeah i think I, I agree with your point that um the way i look at it the right i don't believe that most people on the right most republicans most conservatives are racist are homophobic are any of these things what i do think is legitimate is the idea that they have a soft spot for people who are in that for example somebody like donald trump has said many racist things i'm not going to sugarcoat it for you and for a lot of people, that would be, you know, a no-go. Like, I can't support someone. He said many sexist things, terrible things about women. Um, these are just, this is just the, the truth. Sorry, guys. It's just the, just the truth. And for a lot of people, that would be like a disqualifier. Like, I can't vote for some. And, and for a lot of these Republican voters who have all these other issues they care about, they feel left behind, they feel ignored, they, they have all these other valid concerns that he spoke to, they're not themselves racist. They're not themselves sexist. But it's not that they give them a pass. They're just like, eh, and they, they grimace and they vote for him anyway. That's the yeah. same way. I think 90 plus percent of the people who are still pro Kanye on the right are not anti-Semitic. They don't hate Jewish people, right? They, they would look at this and be like, oh, that's nuts. But they'll just next week still go back to propping up Kanye when he says another right wing thing. Like they just have yeah. a blind spot for it in a and way that I refuse to because I think it's 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 wrong. And I want to be clear, it's not that you never see it on the left. Like I think the the Virginia governor, Ralph Ralph Northam, uh, when it came out that he had this like picture in his college yearbook where he could never remember which one he was, but he was either dressed as a Klansman or um was it something else news? very something racist else, yeah. very bad yeah very racist photo and they basically he stayed in office because they didn't want to have a republican come in and take that seat so it's not that you don't see the left but i do just more so see it happening on the right and it's frustrating to me i don't think anything about this is amusing with kanye it was kind of funny back when kanye was first going crazy and he was tweeting things like kylie stinks like that was hysterical high key funny <laughs> like but yeah. now like at this level it's like no you've got to distance yourself from people like this and really i don't think this kind of person gets help until people do start to really distance and like and say like this is a line that shouldn't be crossed yeah so. well i hope kanye gets well in the meantime i'm not going to make any excuses for his anti-semitism and i think more broadly the right needs to wake up and stop falling victim to the same celebrity worship that we so often criticize the left for Yep, but now totally we're going to shift gears and we're going to talk about a series of stories from around the internet that Hannah and I found interesting this week. And a little bit of a quick hits for the very online, for those of you who are not very online, courtesy of us, some crazy stories from around social media that, that you might find entertaining. Mm -hmm. So guys, Brad and I are very on Twitter. We have a great time there. And honestly, 
if you know who to follow and you cultivate your feed, it can actually be a really great place to hang out. I, I love Twitter and, and I've seen a few things this week that I just want to share with you guys. The first one is truly bonkers, okay? I saw this this morning actually and my jaw hit the floor. This is a Twitter thread from a man named David Leavitt. He, he has 330,000 followers. Um, I've never heard of him, but his byline says award-winning multimedia journalist, uh, has bylines at CVS, AXS, Yahoo, Examiner. So obviously somebody who is in the media. Uh, this man saw somebody on Twitter who said, it's a woman named Tina Ramirez, and she said, I teach my daughter real American history. I refuse to join the radical left's campaign um, to erase history. And so she's responding to him about uh, Christopher Columbus Day, basically, is what's going on here. And he, quote, tweets her and says, can someone please call child care services on Tina Ramirez, who's teaching her child to be a racist? So to be clear, he's accusing her of teaching her child to be a racist because she teaches a different version of Columbus Day than she would like, he would like her to, to teach. He then, it gets worse. Oh? He, yes. He then starts, quote, he starts live tweeting. He's on hold. I'll show it for the video version. He's on hold with child care protective services in Virginia, and he's complaining about how long the hold is. So he starts by saying the Virginia State Hotline for Child Abuse has a 10 minute plus hold and is experiencing quote, quote, high call volumes with 14 callers ahead of me. This is absolutely unacceptable. How many people try to report child abuse and hang up? How many children will continue to be abused? He goes on to continue quote tweeting this exact same statement, um, updating his hold time. It's 20 minutes and it's 27 minutes and it's 35 minutes. All in all, this man appears to be on hold for almost an hour waiting to, to turn this woman in to Child Protective Services um, and then she said, uh, while he's doing this mighty bold and liberal of you to lecture a Hispanic mother with a black daughter on racism, he quote tweets her and says, the lady who's teaching her kids how to be racist thinks I'm bold. Does she know I'm on hold to report her to child and family services? He thinks he did something. Yes. So obviously he is getting dragged. I reported him on Twitter for harassment <laughs> and abuse because you are literally trying to threaten somebody with the violence of the state coming in and taking away their child because you don't like the version of history that she is teaching her child. That makes you first and foremost an absolutely deranged lunatic who needs to be kept away from society. Secondarily, <laughs> uh, this should this should come with a fine. You are tying up actual resources. Isn't this that a crime? Be, Is it, it a false report be? to CPS a crime? I think so. It should be if it's not. And it should have like real hefty fines because while you're complaining about the whole time, you are contributing to it and blocking kids who actually might be in real and present danger from getting access to resources, you crazy person. So I was just, this made me livid. And this is just, I mean, you see versions of this on Twitter, you know, where people just lose their minds. And, and But this is a whole other level when it gets to things like doxing, putting people's personal information out there, calling their employer. Those things are all really, really bad. But this is just a, a level above that. You're trying to literally have their child taken away because you disagree with them. Like, seek help immediately. So the other thing for me is that this, imagine if a right-wing journalist did this to a, to a liberal Twitter user. I think they would be banned. And yeah. I, and also there would be like tons of media coverage of it from like left-wing sites saying like, look, so a uh, right-wing troll harasses mom or uh, false, files false CPS report. But like, and of course he's, I bet he'll get away with it on Twitter. I really like, and just not face consequences. But I, yeah, it's nuts. It's wild. That is not something to be taken lightly. And you're somebody who actually has a, a kid in danger is waiting on hold so he can whine about his Twitter, a tweet he didn't like to CPS. And they're probably, I would love to know what the person who took his call is thinking. I know they can't say anything. I'd love to know. They think WTF is this dude talking about? Yeah, I, I hope they report him, honestly. Like, this, I think it's just vile. All right, what we got up next? So, we just had to talk about this because I saw this on Market Watch. Let me read you a headline and get your reaction. I'm paycheck to paycheck, but I make $350,000 a year. I have $88,000 in student loans, $170,000 in car loans, and a mortgage I pay $4,500 a month on. Do I need professional health? Sir, ma'am, they, whatever the heck you are, 
If you are living paycheck to paycheck on $350,000 a year, yes, you need professional financial help and probably also a therapist because something is wild and out here. Something has gone horribly wrong in your life. The math is not mathing for me. How much did you say in car loans? <laughs> 170,000 and then you look into the details. Guess why? Guess why? Why? Because they, they bought all two kinds of, like, electric vehicles. <laughs> it's like I bought two vehicles? Teslas and now I'm in oh, they're really expensive. Nice ones are really expensive. 60, 70 thousand dollars. That's still uh, only 140,000 dollars if you have two. Like, he's like, what? I bought two Teslas, a uh, $600,000 home, and now I can't pay my bills. What's wrong? <laughs> help. Do I need help? Yes, you need serious help. Oh my god. That's, this is an extreme case, obviously. Like, yes, sir, sell your cars, go buy a Honda, downsize your house. Like, what are you doing with your life? But this is actually indicative of a larger problem in our society. It's often called keeping up the Joneses, but I call it lifestyle creep, which is where when somebody starts, and they've studied this, when people start making more money, a lot of people immediately increase their spending, their lifestyle, and, and so they do continue to live paycheck to paycheck. They've even done studies of people who make over $500,000 a year. I saw yours was about a decade ago, but um, where they had, they'd surveyed them and they said that they did not feel rich, that they maybe weren't living paycheck to paycheck, but they certainly didn't feel like they had a lot of extra money to share uh, over, uh, sorry, they didn't have a lot of extra money uh, to spend each month after their bills were paid. And that, when they looked into it, was because they would do things like join a country club. They'd start sending their kids to more expensive schools. They'd move into certain neighborhoods. And so the thought of leaving one of those things and curtailing that cost was abhorrent to them because their whole identity and like social status and like their friend group and community were all wrapped up in these institutions now that they had to pay a lot of money to access. And so it's something I've always been really cognizant of in my own professional life and career development. It's like not having that lifestyle creep. In fact, I would say I've gone the opposite direction. As I've made more money, I've become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper like back when I did not make very much money I would go out and buy Louis Vuittons and just like do really weird things to try to like have a certain status symbol I think and now that I actually could easily go out and buy a Louis Vuitton I buy fake ones from China like no more like I've gone the opposite <laughs> direction and people need to do more of that because otherwise you are going to constantly be chasing like just basic security financially in your life and that's a terrifying thought that somebody out there could be making Three hundred fifty thousand dollars and living paycheck to paycheck. It's it's. Terrifying. But it's let's be clear. It's nobody's fault except their own. Nothing no. they've said here is I have massive medical debt from my cancer or like nothing is happened to them, right? That's not what we're talking about here. And you know what? I just think I look at this and I'm like, wow, this person really needs student debt relief. <laughs> yeah. The Democrats who want to cancel all student debt would give this person 88k in taxpayer ha handouts because uh, they're they're the struggling working poor that the Democrat Party stands for. Like, bro, what? Oh my goodness, this is just the most like Zoomer millennial thing ever, and it's a stereotype. So many of us are not like this, but some people are, and I do. Like, I don't know how you can be in this situation, but. You don't need professional help. You need a mirror. That's the thing. Because it's you. The problem is you. The common denominator here in all these crazy situations is yourself and your own decisions. And I feel like personal responsibility and this concept are just so lacking in our society today. And that's why you end up with people who find themselves in these messes that are like, okay, who's going to bail me out? Who's going to help me here? Sir, you can help you. You can get out of this hole you dug yourself, and I what? wish you the best. I wish you the best, but uh, oh, what? what were they even asked? Like, why? Did, why did this person go to Market Watch? Like, if I'm if I'm in this situation, the last thing I'm doing is like, let me go tell the general public what an idiot I am. <laughs> 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 like, why were they even reporting on themselves to Market Watch? I don't. They understand. were asking for financial advice, like how to. Oh, also, <laughs> let me say very clearly, nothing we say in this segment should be constituted as financial advice of any kind. We're making fun of you. We are not giving you financial advice in any way to any listener. We are not professionals. We are simply roasting this man. <laughs> uh, and, and with that, we have to talk about a right-wing dating app and the feds. Well, so we actually already covered it. If you missed the episode, though, I'll give a quick recap. But a few months ago, some people who were associated with the Trump campaign um, after he lost came out and announced this new right-wing dating app that was going to be for conservatives only. Uh, it was going to be invite only, 
And basically, they were trying to create, you know, a safe space for conservatives who were having trouble dating on other apps. And this has been reported about quite a bit, but people who list themselves as conservatives, and especially people who might indicate they supported Trump, uh, don't get as many matches on dating profiles these days. And so this was supposed to be the solution for that. The name of the app was called The Right Stuff. Uh, Brad and I roasted it pretty hard when it first We could probably put a clip of us in, in here somewhere. Yeah, but um, we really wanted to be a fly on the wall for this thing because we just thought it might be high key funny and it turns out the app did not disappoint. Um, according to users who have been on it, which have been few and far between because again, the way they structured this thing was you had to have an invite and they uh, reportedly had very few women that signed up. Shocker, and <laughs> I am shocked. <laughs> Shocked, um, and that and it made it very difficult for other people to join, and so it, it's it's been struggling. But now there's another complaint emerging, and that's uh, in the in the review section of the app, and you can find multiple people that are claiming they answered one of the prompts on the app, which was set up as January six was dot dot dot, and the person was supposed to insert uh, their thoughts on January six. But they say this uh, the answering that that prompt is so is, cringe just to bake that one of your suggested things for a dating app. Like, if you have strong opinions about January 6th, I'm not dating you. <laughs> like, honestly, <laughs> it, it should not have been that big of an event in your life. Um, but it said, they say it's leading to them being contacted by law enforcement. So this is what got my attention. Uh, they What if this all, whole thing is a honeypot? That's what they're saying. It's like a scam. It's like a thing. But it's weird because, like, allegedly people involved with the Trump campaign are behind it. But now I'm like, They've were they been just compromised. paid? compromised. Or were they just paid to say it was theirs? You know what I mean? Like, they were actually just, like, influencers for the app that got conned and just, like, promoing it and supporting it. And actually, like, what if it's the FBI the whole time behind it? Like, that is high key funny. And that kind of is what it sounds like. So one user said, do not support this app. And they wrote, okay, the app asked about January 6th. Harmless, right? I said I was there because I was. I'm a patriot. <laughs> I'm a patriot. That's why I'm on this dating app. I use this app for hardly an evening, and it's a coincidence. I get a call from FBI agent the same day. Seriously, what stunt are they trying to pull? Whoever developed this app has to be deep state setting us up. I came here to find love, not a bleep, bleep, bleep warrant. <laughs> <laughs> and then another That's one hilarious. says that the app is an FBI honeypot. They say it doesn't tell you that you need an invite until after you've uploaded and shared a bunch of personal info. Some of the questions, answers that you can add to your profile look like stuff the FBI would like to know. Example, your opinion of January 6th. <laughs> <laughs> so Let's be I... clear. We can't verify these reviews. We don't no. know if it's true, but it sounds pretty sus. It sounds super sus, and I mean, I'll, I'll read one more. It says, unsafe in all caps. <laughs> and they say, I answered the question about January 6th honestly, and the next day I have two police officers at my door telling me that they got a call alleging that I was involved in domestic terrorism. This app was clearly, <laughs> was clearly created by Democrats as a way to subvert our constitutional rights as conservative Americans. Do not use this app unless you want to be harassed by <laughs> left-wing fascists. This other one says, don't trust this app. Uh, it says, I have a friend who worked as a coder on this app, and he showed me proof that the FBI added backdoor access so they could spy on patriots and download their location history. This app is a hoax. Don't download. Don't use. Now, like I said, we can't verify any of this. These could no. even be trolls, like progressives. Uh, who knows? But it is hilarious. What We said this app is not going to work, right? They're not going to get women on this app. It's going to end up being a very interesting crowd. And, um, oh, a ton of the other comments complain about a lack of women. And I'm like, shocker. <laughs> women not a are surprise. largely not Republicans, first and foremost. And if they are, they're usually not They're not MAGA Trump lovers. It's not that many women in that base, first and foremost. So I don't know why they thought this would work, but it's, I mean, who can say what it is or not? But my new favorite conspiracy theory is that this is an FBI honeypot. And <laughs> exactly what it I think the FBI... would be so funny. But it's exactly. all the, the, women that, the women that are on there are all they're fake. All and they're actually like some agent at a desk saying like, yeah, I think the insurrection is so hot. <laughs> Tell me, what did you do on January 6th? Like, <laughs> Just totally catfishing these dudes. Like, they always say, 
They always, the running joke on Twitter is that all libertarian women are feds because, like, you don't actually meet that many libertarian women at events. And I think this is even funnier. This is exactly what I picture the FBI doing with their time. It's just sitting around catfishing guys and admitting they were January 6th. Like, Liz Cheney's there, like, say this, say that. It's just this <laughs> <laughs> great content. It's hilarious. <laughs> all right, okay. we got one more. Okay, so now we're going to talk about this uh, little Twitter thing that went viral featuring my Twitter friend, Sydney Watson, who's a big YouTuber and a Blaze TV contributor. She's a, a right-wing Australian woman. Uh, she tweeted, this is, and people will have thoughts on this. She says, she's a, a petite woman. She says, I'm currently literally wedged between two obese people on my flight. This is absolutely not acceptable or okay. If fat people want to be fat, fine. But it is something else entirely when I'm stuck between you with your arm rolls on my body for three hours. She tweeted, I don't care if this is mean. My entire body is currently being touched against my wishes. This is terrible. I'm laughing, but it's terrible. I can't even put the armrest down on either side because there's no bleeping room. I'm sick of acting like fatness like this is normal. It, she said, if you need a seatbelt extender, you are too fat to be on a plane. <laughs> Buy two seats or don't fly. Um, and she says more. But So this is like a nightmare story. I'm wondering, have you ever had this experience? There's more to this story, but first, of someone who's very overweight and is like occupying part of your seat and touching. I, I know I have. Yeah, I actually had this happen very recently because I almost missed my flight. I'm A-list, so I usually get to board Southwest first and pick my seat. Um, long story short, Atlanta's airport's a disaster, and TSA PreCheck was backed up, and I barely made my flight a few weeks ago. And so I had to board with seat group, which means I was in a middle seat like a peasant. And I was squished between two very overweight people, and I was wondering the same thing. I was like, I remember... Years ago, wasn't there a whole controversy because air, airlines started making people buy two seats if they were over a certain amount of weight? Did that just go away? Like, I actually was wondering this at that time because I was squished in like this, could not move. The guy was all in my seat. It was just super rude, very uncomfortable, and, like, invasive, right? I don't want to be touched by rando men on planes. Like, no thank you. And I, I just, I don't think there's anything wrong with that policy. I do think, especially because airlines continue to condense the size of seats, right? Like they keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. We have consistently less space to begin with. And so when you're already like buckled in there like a sardine, the last thing you want is somebody taking even more of that space. It's I, And I don't understand like why, if you're an overweight person, why you would not just do that. Because I cannot imagine it's comfortable to sit there crammed in to a seat that you don't fit in so i mean i guess money is a resource like some people were so i understand that for overweight people they might not be able to afford a second seat but you might not be able to afford to fly then right because yeah. you don't have a right to occupy half of somebody else's seat and a bunch of people were, were replying to her and saying just fly first class or buy business and i'm like sir like she shouldn't have to Why this is an airline to? problem as well but so there's an update she says uh, she's tweeting this all mid-flight she says update both the fats are sweating on me. <laughs> I have realized that if I lean forward, <laughs> I am less crushed. The only drawback is the man in front of me has his seat back and I keep getting smacked in the head when he adjusts his chair. This is humiliating. This will begin my villain arc. <laughs> I mean, she, I have to say, I think she could be kinder with how she's talking about this. She's but being I do very understand. dramatic. Yeah, she, yes, yeah. she's being very harsh. I agree. But I, I can understand she's in a lot of discomfort. Um, yeah. And so she says, I have begun eating my ham sandwich like a hunched over orangutan, head down, <laughs> facing the floor, squished in my tiny pocket of space, getting hit in the head. No room for my drink bottle. A very sad time <laughs> indeed. This is a plane ride from hell. <laughs> Sounds Wait, did, awful. What airline was it and did they respond? Yes. This is where it gets crazy. American Airlines, it was American Airlines, oh, yeah, and suck. she tagged them, and she replied, they, they replied to her, our passengers come in all different shapes and sizes, we're sorry you were uncomfortable on your flight. What? And she quote tweeted it, she said, this is really their official reply to me being sandwiched between two obese humans, holy bleep, so I'm expected to only have a quarter of a seat when I fly? She tagged American Airlines again and said, I just experienced getting sweat on, touched without my consent, 
smacked in the face and subjected to hours of no personal respect response uh no personal space and your response is basically too bad i mean wow. to that i would say like do your seats come in all shapes and sizes i don't think so yeah no screw screw american screw here there are that's is a terrible response yeah that's horrible i mean this is what happens when i think one you don't have a free market system in the airline industry because obviously they are not worried about competition. They are not worried about customer satisfaction. They can just treat us like crap. They can treat you like crap and then tweet out like basically get over it with some woke nonsense, you know, and, and that suffices as customer service these days. It's disgusting. I won't fly America and I already hated them. I'll fly Southwest Delta. I'm out. Like I won't. <laughs> take the other. I'm, I'm not joking. I really won't. And, um, and so I'm not really surprised, but I think this is just, proof positive of why they these airlines should never have gotten bailed out they should be allowed to fail a lot of them need to go under we need better options in the skies because it's getting to be just honestly it feels like you don't even have human rights a lot of the times when you fly these days. it's really it's really bad i mean you don't even have the right to your own physical space right they're like you'll get crushed and like it and you'll pay us for it <laughs> Say thanks. they basically said suck it up bigot like they basically yeah, are <laughs> yeah. they're like T- sounds tough <laughs> That's the thing. I look. I have compassion for uh, overweight people in some circumstances. There are some for whom it's really not their control. Uh, they're due to medical issues. There are some for whom it's rooted in deep-seated trauma and emotional issues. But I really, I, I don't, I, I don't respect or accept the premise that like being overweight or being fat is somehow akin to an immutable characteristic like sexuality gender or race uh something that you can't change about yourself whether like uh, when something is ultimately for almost everyone a a choice a product of their choices um and it's not a permanent state of being or an immutable characteristic it is it's not discrimination or bigotry to treat them differently because of it or to have views or thoughts on uh, how they came to be in that state. It's again, I think people, and she was a little harsh. I understand she was in a stressful situation, unpleasant situation. And I might be even coming off a little harsh now. We should have empathy and treat people with kindness. But don't start giving me this woke claptrap about how overweight and obese people is, is like, a race or like a gender and that's a category of people that you're being bigoted against like no it's not because it's not an immutable characteristic it's something within people's control which we judge people for all the time what they choose to do with their lives and how they choose to be is is the 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 basis of our society judging people for that Mm -hmm. well i think again i think you can be kind to people but i don't think we should have to make all of these uh, exceptions for people's bad choices, right? If you're a smoker, we don't let you smoke around us because it, it harms other people and invades their space. And I think this is another example of that same kind of premise. Like if you want to be unhealthy and overweight, there are consequences for that. That's your that's your choice, but the rest of us shouldn't have to pay the price for your bad choices. And and again, the vast majority of people like can get this under control, should get this under control. This is becoming a massive problem in the West. We now have more deaths from obesity than we do from hunger. This is it's it's a huge issue, right? It's the biggest killer in our country when it comes down to it. Heart disease and disease are all things that are brought on by being overweight and I'm just I'm really fed up with this push from the left to celebrate this or to act like it's okay or that it's like normal it's not it needs to be addressed there's help out there there's there's nutrition and programs and diet and exercise can go a really long way and it's good for you and we should be telling people that right like these are good things for your physical health for your mental health um so I I really can't stand this kind of the the response by American Airlines is what really gets me like that is just so annoying and they would be better off not responding than doing that that that's absolutely disgraceful but anyway guys let us know what you think of that situation in the comments uh and we're gonna move on and read some comments from last week's episode particularly the segment we did about Candace Owens which got a lot of interaction on YouTube uh, and if, for folks that missed it or didn't listen last week, 
Candace Owens talked about homosexuality being unnatural and posited that many, if not all, cases of homosexuality are due to the person have been, having been abused sexually earlier in life. She specifically talked about Ellen DeGeneres and said that her history of abuse was why she was most likely why she was a lesbian. Hen and I responded to this, said that's not how any of this works. There's studies on this. There's data. That's It's not true. Uh, and we got a lot of feedback. A lot of people agreed with us. Some disagreed. But let's hear what they have to say. All right. So I'll kick us off. We have a comment from Sebastian who said, I feel like Candace Owens has gotten more and more extreme as she's grown her fan base. For example, in 2018, she did a pretty good interview with Rob Smith, another black and gay conservative, and she seemed very supportive of him as he told his journey as a gay man. I guess she started pandering more and more to the traditional Republican boomer crowd, and now we get the content from her as featured in this base episode. I agree with that. I think Brad and I call that audience capture. We see it happen with a lot of people where they start getting feedback for saying negative things, things they maybe don't even believe, and then uh, they like that feedback and attention. They keep going more and more into it, and then they end up, you know, all the way over here in Looney Tunes <laughs> era. So I, I think that is probably true. Yeah. Although I will say, like, she's always been pretty out there. I do think on the gay issue, a few years ago, she was much chiller about it. Uh, I remember her being very buddy-buddy with Dave Rubin when he was... Yeah, I mean, I think she probably has gravitated more towards the extremes on this just in the last few years. Because it wouldn't be typical for a millennial Republican or conservative to be homophobic. I mean, that's really not the vibe in that crowd. That's when her audience, though, is mostly elderly white people, that's... I guess why she's gravitating towards that. So Pedro says Brian Kaplan, for folks who don't know, he's a, an esteemed libertarian economist, has argued that there is a strong social component to being LGBT. He doesn't have a problem with it. I think so. Long as it is there is no sexual transition surgery or hormones in children, I don't see a problem myself. So a couple things here. You, uh, you have to separate the T. I do think there's a social component to being the, to, to gender identity. We've seen like young groups of teenage girls where all of a sudden they all come out as trans, right? There's this doc and it's not clear how common it is, but there is this social contagion effect that we see with gender identity. I don't necessarily think there's anything like that with sexuality. Now, is there some social component to se human sexuality? Absolutely. Very few people argue it is solely biological or genetic, but there's a big difference between having a nuanced discussion about the social po components versus the biological components and saying, it's unnatural. Oh, it's just because you're uh, rape victims who haven't processed your trauma. Like that is not based in reality. There is nothing to that. And that's what we were rejecting from Candace Owens. Yeah, well said. All right, another comment from Skater Boy says, Great video. I've never really cared for Candace Owen. She's always rubbed me the wrong way. Now I know why. She doesn't approach issues with any intellectual honesty. You're definitely less smart for having listened to her, LOL. Facts. I mean, yeah, facts. Emmanuel says, You call yourself based? You wouldn't know based if it hit you in the face. Wow, we just got owned. Oh, and man. the same dude said, Wow, you're crapping on Candace for telling the truth. They, they, they like, always think they're like the bravest truth tellers, like regurgitating my 1970s boomer talking points that have been debunked for decades. I'm just bravely saying the truth. No, you're just pandering to boomers and seeking attention with inflammatory statements. And now you're mad at us for pointing out that you're wrong. Sorry. I think Emmanuel is Candace's alt. <laughs> She's like, no, yeah, I'm right. <laughs> Um, okay, next up we have Barquette who said, the good thing about libertarians is that we don't, we just don't care who people sleep with. It's simpler. And I gotta say, it really is. I love being totally unbothered by who people sleep with. It makes my life, I'm sure, much happier and more well-adjusted than people who are yeah, so bothered. I, I mean, for me, the only bar is consent and yeah. ad adult, obviously. <laughs> Though, apparently for some libertarians, this is not obvious because there was this one dude who recently... Uh, brought up unsolicited a libertarian senate candidate at a debate that we are uh, should revisit age of consent laws and have a vote on them and i'm like oh god why do you have to go there no let's not um like <laughs> creepy <laughs> uh so Susie says brad in all caps you need to stop participating in all caps gay sex and repent to the all caps lord jesus christ now, I would have sworn this was a bot, this but she does higher. have a picture attached. 
Wait, is it real or she's joking? I it might be real. It can't tell if boomer or fake bot satire. Like I honestly can't tell. Um, <laughs> but that but my answer is no. Nah, <laughs> nope. I'm good. I honestly thought it was a joke, but now you're right. I can't. If it is satire, it's so spot on to a crazy boomer. That's the mark of good sat. It's either really good satire or actually one of Candace's boomer followers, which I think is <laughs> completely plausible. Could go either way. Uh, Camel Smokes 23 said, "Y'all a bunch of freak weirdos that contribute nothing to society." <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, and then Goldie said, I feel like Daily Wire is trying to turn her show a little bit into a gossip show. I keep getting clips of her show on my YouTube feed, and it's all about her views on celebrities. I also think her views are very da da da. I mean, who is her audience? 80 year old white dudes aren't on YouTube. <laughs> That's, I mean, yeah. you're wrong, actually. I mean, 80, no, but there are a lot of 50s and 60s people in late 40s who are on YouTube, and that is her audience. Um, but I agree. I mean, she always talks about celebrities and Hollywood drama, and that's fine to do a little bit of that. But it's important to note that, like, she's not really offering hard-hitting analysis on any policies or issues of substance most of the time. And that's for a reason. So <laughs> this comment was funny, but it really shouldn't be. It's kind of sad, actually. Uh, Finicky said, the whole women who are abused by men end up lesbians thing falls flat on its face because there would be way more lesbians than there are. <laughs> Oh my god, mic drop. Seriously. It's, that's a good point. That's it's a like good great point. point. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, it's very true. But, wow, I had never thought about that way. Great commentary. Um, Bilal said, we can't get the Democrats out of our wallets and we can't get the GOP out of our bedrooms. If you're still thumping a drum over who someone sleeps with consensually, you are not, you are not a proponent of liberty, period. Yep. Yeah. So Benjamin said, and this echoes a point that I made in response to Candace, the idea that natural equals good is absurd. Nature encompasses all both what you like and what you don't. Even if you believed a snake's venom is bad, it's still natural. Yeah, exactly. Nat something being unnatural is not an argument that it is bad. It's just yeah. not. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Monica said, seeing millennial slash Zoomer conservative pundits finding out about classic anti-gay talking points from the 80s and getting all excited like they discovered America is almost cute. Like watching your younger sibling learn about the Beatles and they go, no, wait, why did it stop being popular? I love this. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Good. You're, you're not wrong. Yep. Uh, Thin White Axe says, I bet you she has no problem with gay people in real life, and she's just spouting this stuff off for clicks and her audience's confirmation bias. She certainly didn't mean to seem to mind chatting, hanging out with Douglas Murray and Dave Rubin, for example. Yep, I, I think that's true. I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, All right guys, guys, that's it for our comments. If you comment on our YouTube videos, a lot more people have been watching the video version of the podcast, which is awesome. Uh, if you comment on YouTube, we will uh, consider reading your comment next week. So definitely head over there. Just search Brad Palumbo or Hannah Cox. Find our videos uh, and, and shoot us a comment. But now, Hannah, do you have a hot take for us today? Hmm. No, you go first. I've got to think of mine. Okay. My thing is that health drinks and health foods and everything, stop pretending that you taste good. Like... <laughs> Seriously, like if it's a protein powder, if it's like a meal replacement shake, if it's a supplement, anything. I've seen a few ads recently where they, they admit they're like, yeah, it tastes nasty. Because you know why? It's just raw fuel, no sugar, enough. And I'm like, I appreciate your honesty rather than you telling me that it's going to taste like blueberry raspberry candy and then it tastes like acid waste, right? Like just be honest in your branding and be like no this will give you get you this pre-workout will get you lit up for your workout and boost muscle growth and it's going to taste like battery acid don't don't <laughs> they always pretend they can make it taste like it's not what it is which is like health foods and supplements and nutritional stuff and all this stuff and you can't so just don't bother lean in that's my hot take because i hate the taste of like fake artificial stuff like the um, the kids' cough medicine that's like the cotton candy flavor or bubble gum or whatever, like the, the fake artificial flavorings. When you put that on something that doesn't taste good to try to make it taste good, I think it just makes it taste like 
uh, literal vomit. That's my hot take. It sounds terrible. But also, nobody would buy it if they told the truth. So I do understand the marketing. But I'm going to go in the same direction. I have another issue with food marketing. And that's the... Um, and I want to preface this first by saying I don't want the FDA to exist, right? It's not an issue big enough where I think there should be an FDA micromanaging how products are labeled or any of this stuff. But it is just an annoyance I have. I don't eat keto anymore. I did for some time. But I do still like to eat low carb. Um, and increasingly, I'm seeing keto branded on products in grocery stores. And I'll get really excited because it's usually for something that is not inherently keto, right? It'll be like a bread or it'll be a pancake mix. And I'll get excited because if you're actually eating keto, it's gluten-free. There's no wheat flour in any of the recipes. It would all be almond flour. And if you're eating keto, just so everybody knows the rules, it's 20 grams of carbs or less a day. But innately, when I go and look at these products that are labeled keto in grocery stores, they are never actually keto. One, they almost always have gluten, wheat flour involved. And two, their carb counts will be like 30 grams of carbs, which wow. is low for a piece of bread or a pancake compared to a regular piece of bread or pancake. But if you're only allowed 20 grams of carbs a day on keto and one piece of bread or one pancake is 30 grams, it is not a keto product. And so they are mislabeling. And, and if you think, and it, it's frustrating, one, because I don't end up, I get excited and I never end up getting to eat it. But two, I'm like, if you were somebody who wasn't as informed on these things as me and you think you're eating well and you're trying to like lose weight, this is the kind of thing that will really set you back because you think you're like, cutting things out and eating healthy and you're actually not you're just getting scammed so see i, I actually really do think that reg like regulation wise like that's false advertising that's a form of fraud i do think maybe that shouldn't be allowed yeah yeah maybe i mean but i guess that could just be a law i don't think we should have the fda still oh I sure it should go I mean, away who has to do it i don't care and it's like but... and then you get into the weird stuff where they're like you can't call almond milk milk because people buy pink cuts from cat like some of that gets to be really stupid Oh, I, I agree. Like, I've talked about how stupid that is. But I think I think we could draw a line where it's like you can't make an objectively false claim that's meant to be interpreted literally. Like, mm -hmm. for example, keto is not meant like, oh, well, we don't mean it literally. Like, no, they're literally trying to tell you it's keto. Whereas calling your it oat milk, people should know like that they're not literally telling you it came from a cow. I think, I don't know. I get what you're saying, though. It is kind of a slippery slope. It is, but it is frustrating, and I think that's just BS on those companies' part. So watch your labels, folks. All right, guys, that's a wrap. Hope you enjoyed the episode. We'll see you next week, and until then, stay based.